Today's sermon text is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Nehemiah 1, 4 through 11. These are the words of God. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Let's pray. Lord, may the meditations of my my heart and And uh, the words that I speak be pleasing to you, and may we all be edified as we glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Welcome to the second sermon in uh, in what I believe is going to be a 62-part series on the book of Nehemiah. Last week, Dr. Bray introduced the book. And we heard about how Christians act for the kingdom of God because of God's providence, because of his unfailing promises. Dr. Bray showed us how those Christian acts must be preceded by acts of devotion. He discussed prayer and fasting, so maybe that's why all of you look a little thinner today. A little gaunt. Gaunt, yeah. Dr. Bill left us at Nehemiah's abasement. Right In verse 4, which we also read today, we find Nehemiah sitting down and mourning for days and fasting and praying before the Lord because the remnant that is back in Jerusalem is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are destroyed by fire. The remnant, it's in great trouble. It's in shame. It's in shame because of its disobedience. Its failure to adhere to, to cling to, the covenant that we read about this morning in the Old Testament reading. So here, we have the hope of Israel. They're supposed to be the salvation of the world. They've been through the Babylonian captivity for 70 years, as prophesied. They've uh, they've sent back the promised remnant under Zerubbabel, 42,000 people to rebuild the greatness of Israel, the remnant through whom... We're supposed to have the seed of the woman that's going to save the world. And they've fallen flat on their faces. These are the are pockets of brilliance. They rebuild the temple. But in the book of Nehemiah, we see that ultimately the remnant is being unfaithful. If you're like me, this, this hits pretty close to home, which is probably why the elders picked out Nehemiah to study. A nation that begins in covenant faithfulness with God a nation that makes its mission to save the world and then falls into sin and that ultimately can't even defend itself. Just look at the short arc of of history during my lifetime. So if you start before my lifetime, in a great awakening, the third great awakening in the 50s with Billy Graham, and you enter into this slough of despond with the 60s and 70s, then comes the 1980s. In, In 1991, America saves the world again, this time from communism. And our, from our current vantage point, you know, today it's hard to remember just how big of a blessing that was to the world and to the United States. So at that point, 
I'm 10 years old, and I remember something of a great spiritual movement through the 80s and 90s. I'm thinking of things like promise keepers that would fill football stadiums with Christian men seeking him. See you at the pool stuff. Uh, some mediocre but listenable contemporary Christian music. Chip uh, will provide you with some of that if you guys want any. Kurt Warner wins the Super Bowl. That was pretty cool. There was the hard right turn of the Southern Baptist Convention, the growth of the Christian homeschooling movement. Does anybody remember space shuttles, right? Space shuttles were pretty great. Going further into the 2000s, you've got the resurgence of what I would call faithful doctrine under figures like John Piper, John MacArthur, and R.C. Sproul. But over this time, there's a dark side emerging as well. So we've got 9-11, and we realize there's a world out there that hates us. We try to beat them back in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we can't. The world does not work that way. We can't manhandle the world. The Internet starts as a tool, thanks to Al Gore. And then it's the tool. And then it's indispensable. And now it's a disease. It's addicting. And then it's a tool of the state against us. Politics turns crazy. Does anybody remember Will Ferrell's impression of George W. Bush? Everybody can laugh at that, even George W. Bush. Now we elect political figures explicitly because they're caricatures. There's COVID, of course. Can we say more about COVID? Well, how about this? The next one's coming. Does anybody know how to spell H5N1? How about abortion? What a blessing to see the end of Roe. But what's the reaction from Americans? Mainstream Americans are streaming back to abortion in a big way because the average American loves the abortion. They must murder their babies. Given the opportunity to roll it back or it all together, they're rejecting resolutions with fatal regularity. Republicans that want to roll back abortion are being rejected hard and fast by electorates around the nation. It's a third rail topic for the Republicans. Their talking points say avoid abortion, including right here in Kansas and Missouri. Let's talk health. Americans, American men are infertile because they're obese. American kids can't join the military because they're obese. One fifth, one in five American high school graduates actually meets the requirements to join the military. And folks, those are not high requirements. Those are not high requirements. The vast majority of that is just plain obesity. The next highest factor preventing recruits is mil mental illness. What a basket case of a nation we've become in about a decade or two in terms of health, obesity, mental health. We're a cursed people when it comes to health and it happened very, very quickly. The trans thing is completely bizarre. When I joined the military, you couldn't openly admit to being a sodomite. And now we actively recruit transvestites. This is a health issue. This is a spiritual health issue. It's a tough year for me personally to observe these trends as I wrap up a career in the Army. On June 26, 1998, I raised my right hand on the plane at West Point and I vowed to defend the Constitution. Behind me was a nation ascendant at peace and in a lot of ways, faithful. A couple of weeks ago, 25 years later, the Fort Leavenworth, the Army handed me my retirement flag. And behind me is a nation broken and breaking, a constant war and conflict and an active rebellion against Christ. As I heard these words, I sat down and wept from, and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So what did Nehemiah pray? Today we'll find out. And then I want you to go home. I want you to imitate him. I want you to go home and I want you to pray like Nehemiah. And after that, I want you to go out and I want you to save the nation. And I want you to start right here in Leavenworth. So we're going to look at Nehemiah's prayer. We're going to see three things. Number one, Nehemiah correctly diagnoses the spiritual crisis 
He correctly diagnoses the situation as a spiritual crisis. Point number two, therefore, the basis of all his subsequent action was repentance. And that repentance was, in order of increasing difficulty, a national repentance, a familial repentance, and a personal repentance. And then point three, folks, Nehemiah was no prophet. He was a normal man, a normal man who prayed. All right, so number one, Nehemiah correctly diagnoses the situation as a spiritual crisis. Church, why does it take Tucker Carlson, irreligious, profane, hot-dogging Tucker Carlson to be the elite that diagnoses the national challenge as a spiritual crisis? Did anybody see the video? Tucker Carlson saying that it's a spiritual crisis. It's not a political, it's not an academic crisis. We're in a spiritual crisis, and he asked for the nation to pray. And I don't mean some mealy mouth platitude of a crisis about how there's an evangelical battle for people's souls. So you should carry your Bible around with you at public school and that you should memorize the Romans road by heart, although you should do all those things. No, I mean what Carlson means. I mean that the thirst for baby blood and the ravening pack of wolves sterilizing minors, that we're not talking about spirit or political differences here. It's evil. Douglas Wilson did that reaction video to it, and he was right. He said it's a satanic oppression. It's a satanic assault. He said that principalities and powers are making their move. And this is from Mr. Carlson, not from Russell Moore. I want, Mr. Carlson wants you to pray that God would call off the demons. Other elites, like Russell Moore, think that Tucker Carlson is the demon. It's a spiritual crisis. And Nehemiah, the dumpster fire that was the remnant of Israel, was not in crisis because they made poor policy choices or because they weren't loving their Philistine neighbors enough. Certainly those things were true. But they were in a crisis because they were in spiritual rebellion against God. In our passage today, verse 7, Nehemiah says, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah understood that there were consequences to rebellion. He understood the covenant, and Israel was in breach. God had brought the disaster upon Israel. He brought it because of their unbelief and rebellion. And that's where we're at today. And Tucker Carlson understood it, understands it. So what do we do? We start where Nehemiah started, and he correctly diagnosed the situation as a political crisis. And therefore, point number two, the basis of all his subsequent action was repentance. And that repentance was, in order of increasing difficulty, national, familial, and personal. So look at verse four in Nehemiah one. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept I mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of my people Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you commanded your, your servant Moses. So this isn't time for business as usual evangelicalism. It's time to hit our needs, which is probably where we've needed to be the whole time. As Dr. Bill said last week, it's time to fast as a church. It's time to pray as a church. And it's time to confess our sins as a nation, as families, and personally. And let's look at that for a second. Let's examine what it means to confess our sins as a nation and personally because it can be pretty easy to rattle off our sins as a nation. As I've just done, it's easy to pick out the sins of the other guys. And my sermon so far has been pretty uh, thick with like clickbait, red meat for our crowd, right? But because not many of you are killing babies or neutering your sons. 
And Matthew Henry notices this when you read his commentary on Nehemiah. He notes that Nehemiah confesses the sins of all Israel. And then he puts in this little parenthetical phrase. He's just a bit of Matthew Henry Puritan snark. He says, it was no great mortification to him to own that. Essentially, he says, it was no skin off Nehemiah's back to confess the nation's sins. And that's the trap we can fall into. The elders, when they call us to confession in our service, do a good job of this. We confess the sins of our nation, but they're faithful to snap us right back to the personal. It's not what our neighbor needs to confess, but it's what you personally need to confess. But Nehemiah does confess his nation's sins. Those national sins are the covenant-breaking sins. Not necessarily Nehemiah's personal sins. Nehemiah doesn't personally break the covenant, though he does. But somehow, as a nation, they're covenant-breaking sins as a nation. And here we see Nehemiah confessing the sins that he did not do. He confesses his personal sin, but he was not even in the same country as the remnant of Israel. Yet he owns their sins. He takes on their sins before God to confess them. And he does it in a way where you know, he's intending to show us, the reader, that his prayer was effective. Israel has violated the covenant. And then I, Nehemiah, confess that sin. Therefore, please God, accept this confession and give me success in front of the king. And in the book of Nehemiah, it works. So Nehemiah wants to, us to see how this confession of national sin was effective in restoring Israel's side of the covenant, at least in terms of opening the door with Artaxerxes, the king. So what does it mean to confess the sin of our nation and how should we do it effectively? How do we do it in a way that wraps our personal selves around our nation, that avoids a confession of national sin that's just flippant and ineffective and ineffective that doesn't affect us personally. And here's the question as I formulate it. I write, what is the relationship between repenting on behalf of your nation and repenting on behalf of yourself? And now we're going to break that down. We're going to say, what is the nation? And then we're going to say, what is the relationship between personal and national repentance? First, I do want to understand the nation uh, and this is going to be a bit of a jag. It's kind of like a sermonette. It's kind of like free. So we'll see what this has to say. And what is a nation? This is a bit too big to, to bite off, but I'm just going to offer a couple thoughts. Number one, there is a nation. There is a nation, and it does matter in the kingdom of God. That's number one. And then number two, nationhood that's based in membership of families and communities. It's based around your family. It's based around your community. And it is not at all in any way whatsoever about ethnicity or race. None. So first, there is a nation. In our two readings today, we started off in the Old Testament in the Ten Commandments. And I want to hone in on the fourth or on the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment is honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and mother. And this is the root of the nation. Your responsibility to your forebears, stretching back in time, stretching forward in time. The Westminster Catechism is very good actually on this. I'd encourage you to go read it. It's encouraging on the fifth commandment and it spends a good amount of time talking about the fifth commandment's requirement not for kids, but for fathers and mothers. And anyone else who's in a superior position. Responsibilities that superiors have for their people. The fifth commandment connects you to your people and to your neighbors. It connects you to the land. It says that your days may be long in the land, not just any land, but the land like America that the Lord your God is giving you. He gave you your land. It's his and he gave it to you. He's your ultimate father from whom you've inherited the land and we've inherited it as a people, as communities and as families. People 
and land. That's the nation. And we see that in the New Covenant as well. Our New Testament reading highlighted Paul's heart for Israel, his nation. A nation that, frankly, had rejected him. And yet he still followed the fifth commandment. And he yearned for their good, for the salvation of his people. Just as Nehemiah is doing in our passage today. And some of you may say, ah, but look, he loves his race. Paul loves his ethnic people. You should repent. You should put Satan behind you right now, if that's what you're thinking. Let me show you why love for your nation has nothing to do whatsoever with ethnicity or with race. And this is completely inadequate as well, but it needs to be pointed out. So you should turn, turn to Exodus chapter 12, and we'll start in verse 43. We'll go through 49. So that's Exodus chapter 12, verse 43 through 49. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is brought, bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house, and you shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near it and keep it. He shall be as the native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There should be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. So both ethnic and racial Hebrews or sons of Abraham, everybody descended from actual Abraham, ethnically, racially, them and other races comprised the nation of Israel. It was a multiracial people living in God's land. You could join, from any race, the covenant of God. You could get circumcised. I didn't have time to look it up. I've been a bit busy. But, but you, you, baptism comes from that ability to join, in the, in, to join the Hebrew race or to join the Hebrew nation, to join Israel and to join the circumcision, to join the covenant. Anyone could, that loved God could join the covenant through circumcision in the Old Testament. Paul doesn't love Israel from, because of their race or because of their language or because of their common culture or because of their cuisine. None of that. Paul loves Israel because God loves Israel. Which love God made manifest in the covenant. And I really want to be strong on this because this could be a stumbling block for our crowd. For the CREC, for everybody that listens to our podcast and that listens to our books or reads our books, if you actually still read books and don't listen to books. And I want to be as strong on this because we all have the case for Christian nationalism by Stephen Wolf. And in that book, on page 135, here's what he says. He says, Stephen Wolf says, I use the term ethnicity and nation almost synonymously. I use the term ethnicity and nation almost synonymously. Though I use the former ethnicity to emphasize the particular features that distinguish one people group from another. Since every people group has internal differences, for example, class-based differences, nation is used to emphasize the unity of the whole, though no nation, properly speaking, is composed of two or more ethnicities. Is that a one-off paragraph? Well, actually, he spends a lot of time on ethnicity and nation. He conflates the two. As he says, nation and ethnicity are the same thing. He develops a principle of similarity where people that have the same culture tend to gravitate to one another. This is all good, he says. He says we need more of this because the elites are trying to atomize us and homogenize us to try to grind the cultures down that sustain us. And this is, folks, this is some crazy talk. 
This is crazy talk. So let's be fair to Dr. Wolf. I'm with him on the threat. I'm with him on the threat. The threat he's defending against is this sort of homogenization of rampant capitalism, or what he'll call state capitalism. Being force-fed to Americans by global elites, we've all seen it. We've all seen our towns dry up. Dr. Wolf is trying to reestablish the cultural and uh, the culture and the boundaries that protect us from this global elite. I'm with him. How do we establish those boundaries? How do we uh, revive our country? And I'll be charitable and say that he's just being sloppy. Because he is very, ex very explicit to say that he doesn't mean race. He says he doesn't mean DNA. He says, and I'll take him at his word, but taking him at his word, we see that the very best, he's just being sloppy. Because his readers, including the CREC crowd, will read ethnicity. He says nation and ethnicity, the same thing. They'll read that and they'll, they'll read ethnicity and they'll understand race. Because race is a commonly understood way of delineating ethnicities in America. He would have said, he could have said family, he could have said community, instead he said ethnicity. What a dangerous, dangerous place to go. The issue of race 100% deserves special treatment in this country that fought a war over slavery and then had to work through a century of legally mandated bigotry and is still dealing with racial violence. Say what you will about the source of that violence, the violence it is, and it is racial. So remember back when the CREC changed its name? <laughs> that first C used to be Confederation, and we didn't know what they meant by it. Now it means communion, and they were right to change the name. So it's a thing. This is a thing. Moscow Set do have great materials on this. I highly recommend Douglas Wilson's book, Skin and Blood, where he denounces ethnicity and race. I uh, really recommend CREC's statement on kinism, uh, which is uh, another kind of racism. So you must be careful, careful, not careless, but full of care as an American Christian building community. How do you build community? Well, I think about a friend of mine who grew up in a very small town in the American West. She was white, but the town was full of Mexican immigrants. And many of them lived next door. Her best friends were Mexican immigrants. Spanish language and Mexican uh, cooking, they were definitely still foreign, but they were absolutely integral to the community and to my friend's understanding of her place and her country. The Mexican immigrants were and are a part of her nation, completely regardless of their ethnicity and their race. So number one, there is a nation. We saw that from the Ten Commandments. We saw that from Paul. But number two, it is based in families and it's based in communities and not at all in any way based in ethnicity or in race. So I apologize for the sermonette. Now on to what you really wanted to hear about. The question, having understood what is a nation, what is the relationship between repenting of national sins and repenting of personal sins? First, we are all connected covenantally as a nation, as the American church. Back to Paul and to Romans in chapters 9, 10, and 11, that, those chapters will kind of make your head spin a little bit, but if you pay attention, you should pay attention to the nature of the covenantal relationship as Paul describes it. We're all part of the same olive tree. Sometimes it seems like a Lego olive tree in those chapters because he's grafting in and he's cutting out, but these are perfect grafts, perfect grafts that sustain the sap that flows like a river from your spiritual ancestors, from the root in Christ. And who are you grafted to? You're grafted to the people around you. You're grafted to your parents and to your forebears and to your descendants. Where is your sap flowing from? What's the immediate connection to your parents and to your children, to your neighbors, to your leaders? We're all connected. 
Secondly, Nehemiah, distant as he was physically, because he was back in Babylon, as distant as he was physically, it was a part, he was still a part of the olive tree of Israel. And it was from that covenant connection that he appealed to God. Israel sinned. Therefore, Nehemiah bore that sin in an active sense. Careful here, though, not in the sense that Nehemiah's, uh, that affected Nehemiah's personal salvation. I want to be clear on that. Because we are judged by our own personal relationship to Jesus Christ. But the Father has put you in your personal con- context to do work. And this is the way that it works. You are in covenant relationship. And it has real objective consequences for you. Nehemiah bore the consequences of his nation's sin. You are part of a covenantal church in America by grace, grafted in to the nation of Israel and a subject, therefore, to the rules and the law of the Bible. And you, and therefore, also to those sanctions of that covenant. And the American church is in sin. Therefore, you bear the consequences of the national sins. You feel that, right? And that's what Nehemiah is confessing. Nehemiah is confessing, as he says, the sins of the people of Israel, which we, Nehemiah and Israel, have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. Verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Folks, point number two, every, uh, the basis of all Nehemiah's subsequent action was that repentance. And he repented as a nation, as a family, and personally. All right, point number three, last point, Nehemiah was no prophet. Nehemiah was a normal man, a talented man, no doubt, but he was a normal man who prayed. As we saw, Nehemiah took the sins of his nation seriously, and from there he took action. Not as a prophet. Being a prophet was a tough life in a very real sense. Many of them ended up murdered, but they also had direct words from God, and Nehemiah didn't have any of that. Anybody have direct words from God? Any Pentecostals out there? No? No. Unlike the Pentecostals, Nehemiah didn't have any direct words from God. Nehemiah moved out to accomplish what he, what he could do. And he was an important man, and he could do a lot. Not many of you are prophets, but all of you can pray. And this week, I want you to pray like Nehemiah prayed. Because just like Nehemiah, our nation is in a spiritual crisis. And we have to act, but the basis of that action has to be repentance. We have to repent for our nation's sins, and it has to be personal. And just like Nehemiah, who was a normal man, you have to fast and you have to pray. And if we do it right, we can sing with Martin Luther. Though this world with devils is filled, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, but lo, His doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Let's pray. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servants that we now pray before you day and night for the people of America, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of America, of the American church, which we have sinned against you. Even we, in our fathers' houses of sin, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded us in Christ. But Lord, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people 
whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servants today. And now we pray the prayer unto you that you have taught us singing.